What's it like being an anesthesiology resident? In this video, I sit down and interview Dr. Erica Fagelman, one of the chief residents of anesthesiology at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. She tells us what her daily routine is like, what sort of cases and procedures she does, what sort of skills are necessary, what are some of the biggest highlights and challenges. If you find this video interesting, I'd really appreciate if you like it and subscribe to the channel. Now let's dive in and see what Dr. Fagelman has to say about being a resident in anesthesiology. My name is Erica Fagelman. I'm one of the CA3 anesthesiology residents at Mount Sinai and finishing up my last two weeks. Um, I was also one of the chief residents this year. I went to medical school at SUNY Downstate College of Medicine in Brooklyn and then was here for my entire residency. And after graduation, I'll be staying here for a liver transplant anesthesiology fellowship, which is one year, and then hopefully I can stay here as faculty after that. So typically a regular day um, during the week would be, actually starting the night prior, we would get our assignment for the following day, which would let us know which operating room we're in and the types of cases that we're scheduled for. And typically we spend some time looking through our patients for the next day, the night before, so that we can come up with an, um, as, you know, an anesthesia plan for the patients, and we can identify any potential issues with any of the patients, any potential workup that needs to be done prior to the operating room that hasn't been completed, and so that we can familiarize ourselves with how sick or how not sick our patients are and the complexity of the cases that we have for the next day. So depending on the case um, variety and the types of patients we have, usually we come into work around 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning. Fortunately, we have morning lecture at 6.30 and that's now virtual so we're able to listen and participate in that as we come to work and as we set up our operating room. And typically on a regular day our operating rooms start at 8 a.m. The cardiac cases usually start a little bit earlier but across the board most start around 8 a.m. And so we have you know usually an hour or so before the cases start where we're in the operating room and we're getting set up and we have time to interview our patient and often we place an IV in the holding area after we interview the patient before they come back into the operating room. So some of the setup entails stopping by our anesthesiology pharmacy where we get our controlled substances each day and then you go to your operating room and you'll set up for your first case of the day. Sometimes that may be a very straightforward case and so the setup is pretty simple and sometimes it's a complex case and the setup may take you time and there may be lots of different components to it. You'll go out and interview your patient and I think it's a very important time where you don't have that much time but it's important to make a connection with your patient and make them feel comfortable in that short amount of time you have. And as I mentioned, we'll place an IV um, before we go to the operating room and it's nice because once we get into the operating room and we have the monitors on the patient, we can usually give them a little medication to help them relax before we put them off to sleep. And one of the things I love about anesthesiology is our days can be very variable between, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So there may be one day where you have one long case for almost the entire day, and there can be other days where you do four to six short cases, and so there's a lot more turnover involved. Um, and sometimes those are simpler cases, and sometimes the longer cases are more complex. And we also get to rotate. So each block we usually are doing different types of cases. So one month you may become familiar with neuro cases, and you'll be doing longer neurosurgery cases in that month. And then there may be um, other blocks where you're doing regional cases and sometimes they do a lot of fairly quick orthopedic or, um, cases where we'll do regional blocks for those. And so there's a lot more turnover um, on blocks like that. And then depending on whether you're on call or not on call would dictate a little bit um, sort of how your day would progress and end. So if you're on call and you finish all the cases in your operating room, Typically we check in with the call desk, which is staffed by anesthesiologists, and they'll let us know where they'd like us to go after that, where our next assignment is. Um, and if you're not on call and your operating room finishes, you also check in, um, and if it's later in the day, they may tell you that you can go home for the day. And at some point in the late afternoon, you'll get your assignment for the next day, and you do it all over again. In terms of case variety, early on in training, we tend to do a good amount of general surgery cases. That could range from laparoscopic cholecystectomies to open colectomies um, and sometimes to um, appendectomies as well. Those are really great cases that um, sort of cover the basics but don't necessarily become 
too serious or too in-depth too early on in your training. And so once you become familiar with those, you are able to get comfortable in the OR and you're sort of ready to start conquering some more specialized cases. And so for us, towards the end of the year um, of your CA1 year, which is your second year of residency and your first year of official anesthesia residency, towards the end of that year, you may be able to start doing your cardiac rotation. So that's a whole different ballgame. The cardiac cases are much more complex. They tend to start earlier. Um, the setup for those cases is uh, more significant than it is for other cases so it will take you more time and obviously as you get used to the rotation you become accustomed to that. Typically for cardiac rotation you're coming in earlier in the morning than you would for a different type of case but there is a huge huge wealth of um, things to learn during the cardiac cases so they involve transesophageal um, echocardiography which is where you sort of put a camera down the patient's throat once they're sleeping and you can take a very close look at the heart and all of its valves as they work to fix them and so it's really interesting to be able to guide the surgeons as they work um, typically cases like that involve putting in central lines putting in arterial lines so these may be things that you don't necessarily do in a general surgery case um, and then as you continue to advance in residency, we also do a lot of liver transplant here at Mount Sinai. And so you're able to take at least one month of liver transplant where the setup can be more involved, similar to cardiac. But the focus, I would say, is a little bit more on blood transfusion and the transfusion of different blood products because these surgeries are very intense and they can be prone to blood loss and so you really learn how to do specialized transfusion management and similar to the cardiac cases you are putting in large um, access which for us means big central lines or big IVs um, and it's exciting to take the basic skills that you've learned early on in the general surgery cases and start to expand them to more specialized and complex cases as you advance through your residency. Some of my favorite parts of being an anesthesiologist are um, first and foremost, as I alluded to before, when we meet our patients, it's often the morning of surgery and it's often less than 30 minutes prior to going to the operating room. And for many patients, this is one of the most daunting mornings of their lives. Many patients haven't had surgery before. So we really have a very brief but critical time period um, in which we have an opportunity to make the patient comfortable and to form a relationship with them and have them trust us to put them to sleep in the next 30 minutes for this big operation that they've been anticipating for so long. And I think it, unlike having a long period of time with continuity of care, this is very challenging. And I think it's very important to have excellent interpersonal skills and to really know and understand how a patient feels that morning prior to going into surgery because the way you speak to them and the amount you're able to make them feel comfortable is really important and it doesn't matter what kind of morning you're having it's very important to sort of take a deep breath and make sure that you are there for your patient to make them feel comfortable and obviously that takes place first thing in the morning but it will take place throughout the day as you see each next patient and very often when you wake them up um, you know they thank you profusely and, it, and it's a really nice feeling to know that you've taken care of someone in the way you said that you would and I think that one of the other things I really loved about anesthesiology was the combination of diagnostics and procedural skills. It was um, challenging to find a specialty that combined those in such a great way. I think that there are some specialties that are very procedure heavy and maybe less so intellectual. But I think there are also a lot of specialties that do very, very minimal procedures and they do a lot of thinking. And you know, I really wanted a combination of those two things. I wanted to feel that I was good with my hands and doing procedures, but also that I was able to um, stay a diagnostician and, and, you know, an intellectual as well. So I think another skill that's very important, and this, this obviously relates to having strong interpersonal skills, but not just with our patients, but as anesthesiologists, we work in the team. We work in the perioperative setting and we work in the operating room, which is not just one surgeon and one anesthesiologist. Typically at Mount Sinai, you will have two anesthesia providers, which tends to be an attending and a resident. You will have at least one attending surgeon and one resident surgeon, and you may have a medical student on surgery as well, or on anesthesia. You'll have a circulating nurse in the room, and you'll have a scrub tech in the room. And I'd say that's the bare minimum. And for any given case, you may have more people in the room. And 
it can be difficult at times in a stressful scenario to have all of those different people work well together, communicate effectively, and to get along, let alone to make it a pleasant day. And I think that the way that you behave and the tone that you set in the operating room can really have a huge impact on that. One of the major challenges of anesthesiology is that, for better or for worse, things can become very serious very quickly. And, and what I mean by that is you have to really be able to think on your feet and you have to be, by the end of residency, very confident in your skills and your ability to recognize something going wrong as quickly as possible. So obviously there are many times where we take fairly sick patients to the operating room and you can sort of just assume bad things are going to happen and so you do as many things as you can to prevent those things from happening. And in those cases it's almost less nerve-wracking because the patient is so sick to begin with that you're anticipating that all these things may happen. And um, on the converse, what I sometimes think is more nerve-wracking is the possibility that you would bring a healthy young patient to the operating room for a procedure that seems fairly routine, but recognize that you can still have something completely unexpected happen under anesthesia to this young healthy person that can be life-threatening very quickly and you need to respond and recognize what's going on and, and you know, hopefully be able to address it and save that patient or fix what's happening. And so for better or for worse, the stakes are very high in anesthesiology. A classic example of something that is a potential nightmare and something that we all hope never happens is something as simple as having a severe life-threatening allergic reaction under anesthesia. You have a young healthy patient who unfortunately has appendicitis and needs to get their appendix out, but other than that they have no medical problems and they haven't really been in and out of medical care so they don't take many medicines and they don't have any drug allergies that they know of. So you take this patient to the operating room and you give them the standard antibiotics through the IV that the surgeon would like you to give prior to incision and you all of a sudden start to notice your blood pressure is low, the patient's heart rate is up, you're having trouble giving them breaths through the breathing tube and you know, hopefully you quickly start to recognize that the po this is possibly anaphylaxis, which as we all know is a life-threatening reaction and things can go um, very poorly very quickly. Many thanks to Dr. Fagelman for taking the time to sit down and do this interview. It's definitely inspirational to me, especially as I am just one week out from starting my residency in anesthesiology. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future videos, I'd really appreciate it if you could leave them in the comments below. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.